I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Anthony Arnov. I'm on the editorial board of Haymarket Books, which has the privilege of being one of the sponsors of tonight's event, along with Lannan Foundation. And um, I want to give a very special thanks to Lannan. They do extraordinary work. If you're not familiar with Lannan Foundation, you can go to lannan.org and see an incredible archive of audio and video of the writers, of the artists that they've supported over the years. And they've created a really great treasury of audio and video recordings of their talks, uh, including talks by tonight's speaker, Arundhati Roy. So thank you, Arundhati, for that. And thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you all for coming and thank you Anthony for that very flattering introduction and thank you to the Lannan Foundation for organizing this. Um, it's the 10th anniversary as we all know of the Iraq war and I know that there are uh, veterans from that war here and it's such a honor to be able to speak to you because I, I, I guess many of us in this hall uh, marched and wrote against that war before it happened. I think February 15th was perhaps, there were perhaps 15 million people in the world who marched against the war and yet uh, these representative governments who are supposed to represent us just went ahead and destroyed that country. <clears throat> so. Before I begin to read, I just wondered, I just thought we should talk about Iraq. What, uh, what has happened to Iraq? Who has won what? And who has lost? Certainly the people of Iraq have had a country destroyed and are at war against each other. The women of Iraq, who were amongst the most liberated, enlightened women in the world, scientists, poets, writers, all of them have been pushed back, pushed back into the burqa, pushed back into their homes in some ways because of the danger that faces them. Uh, the people of America have lost. You know, there is a connection between foreclosures and funding a war. Um, but George Bush, he's, he's painting nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just saw some, some paintings on, on the net. He's painting himself in the shower. <laughs> he's painting his dog. And, and, and now I, I'm going to read you a quote, and I want you to tell me who said this. In seeking this path of truth lit by God's love and, and paved by God's grace, the church can be the insistent spiritual voice that makes globalization our servant, not our master. Yes, Tony Blair. Tony Blair has now become an evangelist. <laughs> he, he speaks. He's a, he's, a very, he's a very popular, I don't know if he's popular, but he's a very uh, much in demand speaker. He speaks about ethics and religion and God. He charges up to $500,000, which is about uh, $10,000 a minute, basically, for, for his speeches about God and spirituality and humanity. So it's clear who has won the war. You know, Bush and Blair have certainly won. Their countries might not have, but they have. Meanwhile, you know, the idea, the fact that a million children died in Iraq before the sanctions, which, which uh, Madeleine Albright said was, was hard but worth it, and uh, the tens of thousands of people who have died and the continuing conflict in that entire region 
Dick Cheney says if he was given the opportunity, he wouldn't, he wouldn't think twice before doing it again. Uh, Tony Blair says that it was one of the best decisions he ever made in his life. And if, um, if, he, ha if he hadn't been part of the attack on Iraq, then the poor Iraqis, you know, even the dead ones would be going through what the Syrians are going through today. So we are up against a kind of pathology, you know, I mean, there's, there's a certain level of humiliation involved in carrying on being reasonable and marshalling our arguments and marshalling our facts and counting the dead when you're actually t debating or addressing or trying to influence uh, psychopaths. <laughs> because, no, I, I'm not using this word loosely, but imagine after doing that, to say I'll do it again, you know? So um, we are in some amount of trouble. Um, <clears throat> so so it's, it's a little difficult for me to, uh, I, I don't know exactly, um, you know, how many people are familiar with which parts of my work. So I'm, I'm gonna just try and give you a rough, uh, sort of landscape, and then perhaps Anthony and I will, in our conversation, clarify it a bit. But um, the, the idea of democracy, what democracy means, is something that has, uh, you know, something I've been thinking about for a while. So I'm going to start reading from the introduction of this book called Field Notes on Democracy. It's called Democracy's Failing Light. While we're still arguing about whether there's life after death, can we add another question to the cart? Is there life after democracy? What sort of life will it be? By democracy, I don't mean democracy as an ideal or an aspiration. I mean the working model, Western liberal democracy and its variants such as they are. So is there life after democracy? Attempts to answer this question often turn into a comparison of different systems of governance and end with the somewhat prickly combative defense of democracy. It's flawed, we say. It isn't perfect, but it's better than everything else that's on offer. Inevitably, someone in the room will say, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, is that what you would prefer? Whether democracy should be the utopia that all developing societies aspire to is a separate question altogether. I think it should. The early idealistic phase can be quite heady. The question about life after democracy is addressed to those of us who already live in democracies or in countries that pretend to be democracies. It isn't meant to suggest that we lapse into older discredited models of totalitarian or authoritarian government. It's meant to suggest that the system of representative democracy, too much representation and too little democracy, needs some structural adjustment. The question here really is what have we done to democracy? What have we turned it into? What happens when once democracy has been used up, when it has been hollowed out and emptied of meaning? What happens when each of its institutions has metastasized into something dangerous? What happens now that democracy and the free market have fused into a single predatory organism with a thin, constricted imagination that revolves almost entirely around the idea of maximizing profit? Is it possible to reverse this process? Can something that has mutated go back to being what it used to be? What we need today for the sake of the survival of this planet is long-term vision. Can governments whose very survival depends on immediate, extractive, short-term gain provide this? Could it be that democracy, the sacred answer to our short-term hopes and prayers, 
the protector of our individual freedoms and nurturer of our avaricious dreams will turn out to be the end game for the human race. Could it be that democracy is such a hit with modern humans precisely because it mirrors our greatest folly, our nearsightedness, our inability to live entirely in the present like most animals do, combined with our inability to live, to see very far into the future, makes us strange in between creatures, neither beast nor prophet. Our amazing intelligence seems to have outstripped our instinct for survival. We plunder the earth, hoping that accumulating material surplus will make up for the profound, unfathomable thing that we have lost. As a writer, a fiction writer, I've often wondered whether the attempt to always be precise, to try and get it all factually right, somehow reduces the epic scale of what is really going on. Does it eventually mask a larger truth? I worry that I'm allowing myself to be railroaded into offering prosaic factual precision, when maybe what we need is a feral howl or the transformative power and the real precision of poetry. Something about the cunning, brahmanical, intricate, bureaucratic, file-bound, file applied through proper channels nature of governance and subjugation in a country like India seems to have made a clerk out of me. My only excuse is to say that it takes odd tools to uncover the maze of subterfuge and hypocrisy that cloaks the callousness and the cold, calculated violence of the world's favorite new superpower. Repression through proper channels sometimes engenders resistance through proper channels. As resistance goes, this isn't enough, I know, but for now it's all I have. Perhaps someday it will become the underpinning for poetry and for the feral howl. Listening to Grasshoppers, the essay from which this collection draws its subtitle was a lecture that I gave in Istanbul in January 2008 on the first anniversary of the assassination of the Armenian journalist Harant Dink. He was shot down on the street outside his office for daring to raise a subject that is forbidden in Turkey, the 1915 genocide of the Armenians, in which more than one, pe one million people were killed. My lecture was about the history of genocide and genocide denial and the, almost, the old almost organic relationship between progress and genocide. So this, I think, is, is the subject that all of us uh, need to think about quite often. You know, what do we mean by progress and development? And in uh, Turkey, the, part, the, the political party that committed the Ar Armenian genocide was called the Committee for Union and Progress. And union and progress are two things which in today's world we call nationalism and development. And they have always gone together. So you look at the history of progress, the progress of developed countries, whether it's European countries or whether it's the US, and obviously at the foundation of it, there has been genocide. The genocide of native Indians, the genocide of aboriginals, the genocide of the Herero, and all of this. So today, in today's world, what are we looking at? I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the big misconceptions that most people have is somehow that the wars that are being fought, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya, they were wars against dictators, they were wars against fundamentalist Islam. But in fact, there is a huge collusion between capitalism and fundamentalist Islam. The, the, war, the, the countries against whom the United States has been at war were not, except for Afghanistan where there was no reason to attack it except that uh, you know, something, had, some, something had to be done after 9-11. But Iraq, Syria, 
Libya. These are not countries where you have some fundamentalist Islamic power. The, the fundamentalists were in Saudi Arabia. The Al-Qaeda and the militias are being aided by the United States now in the battles in Syria and in Iraq. So really, the, the, you know, what we think is going on and what is actually going on are two separate things altogether. And while we spend all our energy thinking of one thing, it's actually something else that's happening. And um, much of my work obviously is, is um, at least begins to be situated in India, though many Americans will recognize the similarities in how this discourse happens. So, and how these things are also interconnected. So, in 1989, until 1989, India was a country which considered itself non-aligned. It was actually tilting towards the Soviet Union. And in 1989, when uh, free market capitalism won its war against Soviet communism in the mountains of Afghanistan, the whole world sort of shifted around and India shifted too. And it now calls itself a natural ally of the US and Israel. And just at that time, what happened in India was that the, uh, the government began, opened up its markets and became a free market economy. And at that same time, it opened the lock of a disputed old 14th century mosque called the Babri Masjid, where the Hindus claimed the Lord Ram was born. And so in a way, it, in that time, it opened two locks. It opened the lock of the markets, and it opened the lock of the Babri Masjid. And both these sort of ushered in two kinds of totalitarianism. So you had a kind of economic totalitarianism where you know, protection of labor was, was dismantled, massive privatization, massive displacement of the poor for these big private projects. And you had an increasing communalization between the Hindus and Muslims, which had a whole history, old history, but it was just jacked up to very high. And now we have a situation where the Indian government, whether it's the right wing or whether it's the, in, in American terms, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats in India, whether it's the Congress or whether it's the BJP, they both, these, these two totalitarianisms have unleashed two kinds of what they call terrorism. So there's Islamist terrorism and the, what they call the Maoist terror, which includes all people who are fighting major project, major displacement from mining companies, from infrastructure, from dams, and so on. And by calling these people terrorists, the government is now militarizing in a huge way. So while it calls itself a democracy, you have a country like India, which, which, which is planning to now deploy its army against the poorest people in central India who are fighting big mining conglomerates who are moving into the forest and trying to take over. So, so you see that on the one hand, you have this, this kind of vicious rhetoric of right-wing Hindu nationalism, and on the other, you have this militarization uh, and basically a war against the poor. I think m many of you might have, um, might have been following the trouble in uh, Wharton because the chief minister of Gujarat, Narendra Modi, who uh, is a member of the BJP, was invited to speak uh, through a video link because he's been denied a visa to come to the United States. But he, he was supposed to speak, address this business conference by video and some professors ran a campaign against, uh, petitioned uh, the university to disinvite him, and he was disinvited. And now there's a campaign for the free speech of Narendra Modi. But 
I, I just want to tell you, I just want to tell you who this man is. He was, he was a member of an organization called the RSS, which is the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which was set up in 1927, inspired by the fascists in Italy, inspired by Mussolini. One of their greatest heroes is Adolf Hitler. They very openly praise Adolf Hitler, and I'll read you some of the things that their books say. In 2002, when Modi was the chief minister, uh, a, a, a train full of pilgrims coming back from the destruction of this Ayodhya mosque, which was disputed, the train caught fire. Nobody knows who set fire to the train, and 57 pilgrims were burnt. In reaction to that, under his watch, right-wing Hindu mobs went crazy in Gujarat. They burnt and killed and raped, and something like between 1,000 and 2,000 Muslims were massacred openly on the streets of Gujarat. 100,000 people were driven from their homes. The people who did the killing was, were helped by the police. There was a uh, an, a member of the Legislative Assembly called Ehsan Jafri, who had had the temerity to, to, uh, uh, to stand against Modi in the elections. His house was surrounded by 20,000, my mob of 20,000 people. He made something like 200 phone calls asking for help. The police vans came there and went away. They didn't do anything. The mob surrounded the house. Esan Jafri came down and said, look, there, there were many people sheltering in his house. He came down and he said, look, do what you like to me, but let the women be, let the people who are taking shelter in my place be. They cut off his arms, they cut off his legs, they dragged his body around the place, and then they killed all the people there. They raped the women and they burned them alive. So, and, and Modi said, well, if there's an action, there'll be a reaction. And this man is now the front runner to be the Prime Minister of India. And I just want to read you some of the things that the organization to which he belongs say. These are some excerpts from a book called We or Our Nationhood Defined by M.S. Goldwalker who succeeded Dr. Hedgewar as head of the RSS in 1940. Ever since that evil day when Muslims first landed in Hindustan, right up to the present moment, the Hindu nation has been gallantly fighting on to take on these despoilers. The race spirit has been awakening. In Hindustan, the land of Hindus lives and should live the Hindu nation. All others are traitors and enemies to the national cause or, to take a charitable view, idiots. The foreign races in Hindustan may stay in the country, wholly subordinate to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, far less any preferential treatment, not even citizens' rights. To keep up the purity of its race and culture, Germany shocked the world by her purging the country of the Semitic races the Jews. Race pride at its highest has been manifested here. A good lesson for us in Hindustan to learn and profit by. By the year 2000, the RSS had more than 60,000 branches and an army of more than 4 million volunteers preaching its doctrine across India. Now, at the time when the pogrom against the Muslims happened in 2002, there was an outcry and people were shocked, but since then Modi has won the elections four times. And now he has become the most favorite candidate of India's greatest corporations because he's bringing in a lot of private investment. So if you bring in the money, then a little killing, a little raping, overseeing all of that, is not, such a bad, is not such a bad thing. So 
so you have a situation where where this kind of open i mean we call them fascists because they call themselves fascists meaning they in their books admire the fascists but so you have this fascism on the rise on the one side where you have thousands of young muslim boys who are in jail accused of being terrorists and so on and on the other hand you have this juggernaut of corporate big corporate power big mining companies moving into the forests to take over the land of the poorest people in this country so so what we have is this, uh, what i keep saying the the most successful secessionist struggle in india has been the success the secession of the middle and upper classes into outer space you know and from from there they look down and they say what's our water doing in their rivers what's our um, wood doing in their forests you know what's our bauxite doing in their mountains and if you if you spend much time in india you 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 will hear people saying quite openly look india is on the verge of becoming a superpower all countries who have become superpowers have a past we have to kill you know we have to do we have to move forward somebody has to pay the price this is the way of history so so we are in a in an extremely dangerous situation except for the fact that there's a most tremendous resistance to all of this taking place in the country the government calls them all maoists because that that way they can militarize further and jail people but the fact is there's a bandwidth of resistance movements the most militant are the people the tribal people the indigenous people in the forests fighting against the mining companies because if you look at a map of india you'll see that the forests the minerals the indigenous people and the maoists are stacked up you know one on top of the other but outside of the forests there are bauxite companies and dams and mines and roads and we're talking i mean just big dams alone has displaced 33 million people since 1947 so you can imagine the scale of what we're talking about but i have been writing about the resistance for many years now and uh, last year year before last i i actually went into the forest to meet and spend time with the armed struggle that's going on because the indian government is now planning to deploy its army against the poorest people in the world because they have signed these memorandums of understanding and they've been waiting because the resistance has not allowed the corporations to move in and take the land so i'm just going to read uh from an account of of what happened when i went into the forest it's called walking with the comrades the terse typewritten note slipped under my door in a sealed envelope confirmed my appointment with india's single biggest internal security challenge i'd been waiting for months to hear from them i had to be at the ma danteshwari mandir temple in dantewara chatisgarh at any of four given times on two given days that was to take care of bad weather punctures blockades transport strikes and sheer bad luck the note said writer should have a camera a tikka that's a bindi and a coconut meter will have a cap hindi outlook magazine and bananas the password will be namaskar guruji namaskar guruji i wondered whether the meter and the greeter would be expecting a man and whether i should get myself a mustache <laughs> there are many ways to describe dantewara it's an oxymoron it's a border town smack in the heart of india it's the epicenter of a war it's an upside down inside out town in dantewara the police wear plain clothes and the rebels wear uniforms the jail superintendent is in jail the prisoners are free 300 of them escaped from the old town jail 2 years ago women who've been raped are in police custody 
The rapists give speeches in the bazaar. Across the Indrawati River, in the area controlled by the Maoists, is the place the police call Pakistan. There, the villages are empty, but the forest is full of people. Children who ought to be in school run wild. In the lovely forest villages, the concrete school buildings have either been blown up and lie in a heap, or they're full of policemen. The deadly war that's unfolding in the jungle is a war that the government of India is both proud and shy of. Operation Green Hunt has been proclaimed as well as denied. P. Chidambaram, India's home minister and CEO of the war, says it does not exist, that it's a media creation. And yet, substantial funds have been allocated to it, and tens of thousands of troops are being mobilized for it. Though the theater of war is in the jungles of central India, it will have serious consequences for us all. And to me, this war is the real clash of civilizations because it is a war for an understanding of what happiness means, what progress means, what civilization means. If ghosts are the lingering spirits of someone or something that has ceased to exist, then perhaps the National Mineral Development Corporation's new four-lane highway crashing through the forest is the opposite of a ghost. Perhaps it's the harbinger of what is still to come. The antagonists in the forest are disparate and unequal in almost every way. On one side is a massive paramilitary force armed with the money, the firepower, the media, and the hubris of an emerging superpower. On the other, ordinary villagers armed with traditional weapons, backed by a superbly org organized, hugely motivated Maoist guerrilla fighting force with an extraordinary and violent history of armed rebellion. The Maoists and the paramilitary are old adversaries and have fought older avatars of each other several times before. In Telangana in the 50s, West Bengal, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh in the 60s and 70s, and then again in Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, and Maharashtra from the 80s all the way through to the present. They are familiar with each other's tactics and have studied each other's combat manuals closely. Each time it seemed as though the Maoists or their pre previous avatars had been not just defeated, but literally physically exterminated. Each time they've reemerged re more organized, more determined, and more influential than ever. Today, the insurrection has spread through the mineral-rich forests of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, West Bengal, homeland to millions of India's tribal people, dreamland to the corporate world. When a country that calls itself a democracy suddenly declares war within its borders, what does that war look like? Does the resistance stand a chance? Should it? Who are the Maoists? Are they just violent nihilists foisting an outdated ideology on tribal people, goading them into a helpless ins insurrection? What lessons have they learned from their, their past experience? Is armed struggle intrinsically undemocratic? Is the sandwich theory of ordinary tribals being caught in the crossfire between state and Maoist an accurate one? Are Maoists and tribal people two entirely discrete categories as is being made out? Do their interests converge? Have they learned anything from each other? Have they changed each other? The day before I left, my mother called, sounding sleepy. I've been thinking, she said, with a mother's weird instinct, what this country needs is revolution. The drive from Raipur to Dantewara takes about 10 hours through areas known to be Maoist infested. These are not careless words. Infest, infestation implies disease, pests. Diseases must be cured. Pests must be exterminated. Maoists must be wiped out. In these creeping, innocuous ways, the language of genocide has entered our vocabulary. I arrived at the Ma Danteshwari Mandir well in time for my appointment, first day, first show. I had my camera, 
my small coconut, and a powdery red tikka on my forehead. I wondered if someone was watching me and having a laugh. Within minutes, a young boy approached me. He had a cap and a backpack, school bag, chipped red nail polish on his fingernails, no Hindi outlook, no bananas. Are you the one who's going in? He asked me. No, Namaskar Guruji. I didn't know what to say. He took out a soggy note from his pocket and handed it to me. It said, Outlook nahi mila. I couldn't find Outlook. <laughs> and the bananas? And the bananas? Oh, I ate them, he said. I got hungry. <laughs> he really was a security threat. <laughs> his backpack said, Charlie Brown, not your ordinary blockhead. He said his name was Mangtu. I soon learned that the Dandakaranya, the forest I was about to enter, was full of people who had many names and fluid identities. It was like balm to me, that idea. How lovely not to be stuck with yourself, to become someone else for a while. We walked to the bus stand only a few minutes away from the temple. It was already crowded. Things happened quickly. There were two men on motorbikes, there was no conversation, just a glance of acknowledgement, a shifting of body weight, the revving of engines. I had no idea where we were going. We passed the house of the superintendent of police, which I recognized from my last visit. He was a candid man, the superintendent. See, ma'am, frankly speaking, this problem can't be solved by us, police or military. The problem with these tribals is that they don't understand greed. Unless they become greedy, there's no hope for us. <laughs> I've told my boss, remove the force and put a TV in every home. Everything will be automatically sorted out. <laughs> in no time at all, we were riding out of town. No tail. It was a long ride, three hours by my watch. It ended abruptly in the middle of nowhere on an empty road with forest on either side. Monk too got off, I did too. The bikes left and I picked up my backpack and followed the small internal security challenge. But the Prime Minister says that these people are the greatest internal security challenge to India. Into the forest. It was a beautiful day, the forest floor was a carpet of gold. In a while we emerged on the white sandy banks of a broad flat river. It was obviously monsoon fed and was now more or less a sand flat. At the center of the stream, at the center a stream ankle deep, easy to wade across. And across was what the police called Pakistan. Out there ma'am, the candid SP, uh, superintendent of police said to me, my boys shoot to kill. I remembered this as we began to cross. I saw us in the policeman's rifle sights tiny figures in a landscape, easy to pick off. But Mangtu seemed quite un unconcerned, and I took my cue from him. So this is a long essay, so I'm just skipping bits just to give you uh, an idea of what it was like in the forest, where something like 200,000 paramilitary have been deployed. You know, they're called names like Koya Commandos, Chhattisgarh Armed Force, Central Reserve Police Force, Border Security Force, Indo-Tibetan Border po Police, Central Industrial Security Force, Greyhounds, Scorpions, Cobras, and a pol policy that's affectionately called WAM, which means winning hearts and minds. <laughs> Significant wars are often fought in unlikely places. Free market capitalism defeated Soviet communism in the bleak mountains of Afghanistan. But here in the forests of Dantewada, a battle rages for the soul, not just of India, but of the world. Plenty has been said about the deepening crisis in Indian democracy and the collusion between big corporations and the media and major political parties. But if anyone wants to do a quick spot check Dantewada is the place to go. So, you, you know, you have organizations like Tata Steel, which is one of the biggest corporations in India, which is trying to build an integrated steel plant there. So they are supposed to have a 
public hearing with the villagers, you know, in order to have the plant. But instead, they'll have it 500 kilometers away. They'll take some six or 10 captive people, and the meeting will be held in the collector's bungalow 500 kilometers away. And then they'd be said, yes, everybody is agreed, and here we go. And when you talk about free speech, Tata Steel funds the Jaipur Literary Festival, you know, the famous Jaipur Literary Festival, where everyone was fighting for Salman Rushdie's right to free speech. But in the forest, it's OK for no tribal to have any free speech about their future or uh, any say in their lives at all. So there's this battle between the Tatars and, the, and, and, and these villagers and the Maoists going on. Lohandi Guda, which is a five hour drive from Dantewada, never used to be a Naxalite area, but now it is. Comrade Jury, who sat next to me while we ate this red ant chutney, works in the area. She said they decided to move in after graffiti had begun to appear on the walls of village homes saying, Naxali ao hame bachao, meaning Naxalites who are known as Maoists are known as Naxalites too. Naxali ao, please come and please save us. A few months ago, Vimal Meshram, the vice president of the panchayat was shot dead in the market. He was a Tata man, Jury says. He was forcing people to give up their land and accept compensation. It's good that he's been finished. Do you want some more chapoli, which is ant chutney? We won't let the Tatas come here. People don't want them. I feel I ought to say something at this point about the futility of violence, about the unacceptability of summary executions. But what should I suggest they do? Go to court, do a sit-in in New Delhi, a rally, a hunger strike? It sounds ridiculous. The promoters of the new economic policy who find it easy to say there is no alternative should be asked to suggest an alternative resistance policy, a specific one, to these specific people in this specific forest, here, now. Which party should they vote for? Which democratic institution in this country should they approach? See now, these forest villages, the Indian media, the Indian middle class is constantly going on about Gandhian nonviolence and Gandhian resistance. But the point is, how do people who are starving or go on a hunger strike? You know, how do people who have no money boycott goods? How do people who, whose home takes four days walk through the forest if they go on any kind of non-cooperation drive, there's nobody watching. For non-violent resistance, you need an audience. You know, you need middle class sympathy. You need some kind of uh, feedback. You need a middle class, basically. So the, the debates about armed resistance versus non-violence, that one is moral and one is immoral is is really absurd because it's, I think, immoral for people sitting in Delhi to tell a person whose village is being surrounded by a thousand uh, security guards and burnt and the women are being raped to be nonviolent. You know, it's, it's an immoral suggestion unless you are prepared to go there and act in their defense. It's dark, there's a lot of activity in the camp, but I can't see anything just points of light moving around. It's hard to tell whether they are stars or fireflies or Maoists on the move. Little Mangtu appears from nowhere. I found out that he's one of a group of 10 kids who are part of the first batch of young communist mobile school who are being taught to read and write and tutored in basic communist principles. Indoctrination of young minds are corporate media howls. The TV advertisements that brainwash children before they can even think are not seen as a form of indoctrination. But the young communists are not allowed to carry guns or wear uniforms, but they trail the PLGA squads with stars in their eyes like groupies in a rock band. We're moving in single file now, myself and 100 senselessly violent, bloodthirsty insurgents. I look around at the camp before we left. There are no signs that almost 100 people had camped here, except 
for some ash where the fires had been. I cannot believe this army. As far as consumption goes, it's more Gandhian than any Gandhian and has a lighter carbon footprint than any climate change evangelist. But for now, it even has a Gandhian approach to sabotage. Before a police vehicle is burnt, for example, it's stripped down and every part is cannibalized. The steering wheel is straightened out and made into a Bharmar barrel. The Rexine upholstery is stripped and used for ammunition pouches, the battery for solar charging. Should I write a play, I wonder, Gandhi, get your gun, <laughs> or will I be lynched? <laughs> We're walking in pitch darkness and dead silence. I'm the only one using a torch pointed down so I can see in its circle of light, all I can see in its circle of light are Comrade Kamla, she was my bodyguard, Comrade Kamla's bare heels in her scuffed black slippers, showing me exactly where to put my feet. She's carrying 10 times more weight than I am. Her backpack, a rifle, a huge bag of provisions on her head, one of the large cooking pots, and two shoulder bags full of vegetables. The bag on her head is perfectly balanced, and she can scramble down slopes and slippery rock pathways without, without so much as touching it. She's a miracle. So this was the, one of the things that when I went into the forest, I, I felt sure that whenever a struggle begins to pick up arms, the women are going to be the greatest sufferers. You know? But when I went in, I was disabused of that because 50%, uh, almost 50% of this guerrilla army are actually women soldiers. And I spoke to many of them at length as to why they, they were doing this. And they were doing it for two reasons. One was to escape the patriarchy within their own communities. And the other was because they had watched the soldiers, the paramilitary, and the militias, the government armed militias, rape and kill and brutalize women and the rage of that made them join. And inside this, this huge tract of forest, you have something called the Krantikari Adivasi Mahila Sangatan, which is the revolutionary indigenous women's association, which has 90,000 members. And yet, feminists would not consider them feminist, because in India, as in many other countries, the feminist movement has become domesticated, you know, it's become NGOIs, it's become funded by the very same organizations that are promoting this economic order. So what, I mean, I know that in reading, in the reading of this, I'm coming across as if I'm a Maoist, I'm not a Maoist. But I just, I just feel that in these moments, you cannot be pure about things, you know, you have to, you have to know how to move your weight in order to support the people who are being crushed, you know, the, the people who are being finished off. And while you do that, you have to ask your comrades the hard questions. So I'll end this part by just reading a short paragraph where I am really asking, I'm really talking about the whole question that troubles all of us, obviously, about what is the way in which we can get out of the straight jacket. Because I know that in um, America, surely, you know, so many people are just so trapped in this, in this kind of conveyor belt. And, and we know that we have been entrapped, that our imaginations, I mean, have been controlled in some way. And yet, how do you get off? What do you do? You know, how do you fight it? Uh, historically, communist societies in the Soviet Union and in China have been as destructive, if not more destructive, of people, of environments, as capitalist societies have been. So what we are talking about is looking for a new imagination. Can we expe expect that an alternative to what, what looks like certain death for this planet and its people will come from the imagination that has brought about this crisis in the first place. 
Judging from what's happening in Russia and China, and even Vietnam, eventually communist and capitalist societies seem to have one thing in common, the DNA of their dreams. After their revolutions, after bringing, building societies that millions of workers and peasants paid for with their lives, these countries now have begun to reverse some of the gains of their revolutions and have ch turned into unbridled capitalist economies. For them too, the ability to consume has become the yardstick by which progress is measured. For this kind of progress, you need industry. To feed the industry, you need a steady supply of raw material. And for that, you need mines, dams, domination, colonies, war. Old powers are waning, new ones rising. Same story, different characters, rich countries, plundering poor ones. Yesterday it was Europe and the United States. Today it's India and China. Maybe tomorrow it'll be Africa. Will there be a tomorrow? Perhaps it's too late to ask, but then hope has little to do with reason. The alternative, if there is one, will emerge from the places and the people who have resisted the hegemonic impulse of capitalism and imperialism instead of being co-opted by it. Here in India, even in the midst of all the violence and greed, there is still hope. If anyone can do it, we can. We still have a population that has not been completely colonized by that consumerist dream. We have a living tradition of those who have struggled for Gandhi's vision of sustainability and self-reliance. See, while I'm not a, a fan of Mahatma Gandhi's, there are some things he did and said which were brilliant. And one of the main things was that he was one of the first people to talk about consuming, how much you should consume, and sustainability in a political way, you know? Which is a huge contribution. For socialist ideas of egalitarianism and social justice, we have Ambedkar's vision. Ambedkar was the leader of the the people who are known as Dalits in India or untouchables earlier. Ambedkar's vision, which challenges the Gandhians as well as the socialists in serious ways. We have the most spectacular coalition of resistance movements with their experience, understanding, and vision. And this is one of the things that I think all of us should think about. You know, when we get distracted by the morality that the establishment lays on us about picking up arms, no arms, non-violence, violence. In places like India where people are struggling, you see the choices that they make are not moral necessarily or ideological choices. They are tactical choices. So in a forest, you cannot have a non-violent, I mean a non-armed resistance. You have to defend yourself in the, in, in, with arms in, in that situation. Outside the forest, you cannot have an armed resistance. You'll be crushed. So you have to be militant in other ways. So while academics and historians and writers and journalists like to lay their morality on people, people I ca I've seen can be Maoists in the forests and Gandhians on the street, you know? Uh, they don't have, I mean, they can move, they can shift identity. Most important of all, India has a surviving Adivasi population, uh, indigenous people's population of almost 100 million. They are being pushed into the market or they're being crushed, but still, they still exist, they still remember how they used to live. They are the ones who still know the secrets of sustainable living. If they disappear, they will take those secrets with them. Wars like Operation Green Hunt will make them disappear. So victory for the prosecutors of these wars will contain within itself the seeds of destruction, not just for the Adivasis, but eventually for the human race. That is why the war in central India is so important. That's why we need a real and urgent conversation between all those political formations that are resisting this war. The day capitalism is forced to tolerate 
non-capitalist societies in its midst and to acknowledge limits in its quest for domination. The day it is forced to recognize that its supply of raw material will not be endless is the day when change will come. If there is any hope for the world at all, it does not live in climate change conference rooms or in cities with tall buildings. It lives low on the ground with its arms around people who go to battle every day to protect their forests, their mountains, and their rivers because they know that the forests, the mountains, and the rivers protect them. The first step towards reimagining a world gone terribly wrong would be to stop the annihilation of those who have a different imagination, an imagination that is outside of capitalism as well as communism, an imagination which has an altogether different understanding of what constitutes happiness and fulfillment. To gain this philosophical space, it is necessary to concede some physical space for the survival of those who may look like the keepers of our past, but who may really be the guides to our future. To do this, we have to ask our rulers, can you leave the water in the rivers, the trees in the forest? Can you leave the bauxite in the mountain? If they say they cannot, then perhaps they should stop <clears throat> preaching morality to the victims of their wars. So I think Anthony and I will talk a little now. I, I, I think it's a little potted history, I know, but I didn't know how else to communicate a very vast and complex canvas of what's going on in the world. Thank you. So um, this morning, uh, when, when you were on Democracy Now! or Naughty, um, they played clips of a speech that you had given at the Riverside Church in New York. And I had the privilege of being in that speech. But one of the bittersweet things about seeing that for me was that that night you were there with Howard Zinn. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about you know, losing Howard, but also finding Howard and how you came to discover him and have a relationship with Howard and, and also how he came to play a certain role in, in India and as, as a figure of someone in the United States opposing so much of what you've described tonight. I think, I think um, one, of the <clears throat> one of the big uh, lessons that I learned after 9-11, you know, when, when, uh, when the attack on the Trade Towers happened, I, uh, you know, it was a time when God of Small Things was riding a big high and, you know, selling millions of copies around the world. And I had written about things in India, about dams, about nuclear tests. And, and, um, when, when I was so enraged at, at, at the idea that now there was going to be a war in Afghanistan and I thought of writing, and I thought, uh, okay, I'll, I'll write this piece and it'll be goodbye America, you know? <laughs> I, I, I guess uh, you had this idea that every country is some sort of homogenous block. And, and I found to my shock the opposite to be true, that I wrote this essay called The Algebra of Infinite Justice. And then I came here and I met Howard and I met Anthony and I met Anthony before that, of course, but uh, you know, Howard is a person who, who is embraced by people in Kashmir, by so many people, so many struggling people in India. Um, he has said some of the most profound things, a, a, a scholar who, who links himself, not just with his mind, but with his heart too, to yeah. resistance movements. Um, he, was, he, he was really uh, a beautiful presence in the world. And I remember just a week before he died, 
you and he called me and I said, Howard, I want you to know that I still have a huge crush on you. And he says, Howard, daddy, I take that sort of thing very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, and he, he died the death of an artist. You know, he died wow. swimming. Mm -hmm. And I think that was beautiful. Yeah. And, um, you, you mentioned that Howard was known in Kashmir, and, and um, this book has just come out, Until My Freedom Has Come, that you contributed to. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you came to be involved in this struggle, in this issue, and to take a stance that ultimately led to you being, you know, people calling that you should be charged with sedition for speaking out in India on the occupation. Well, uh you know, it's a shame uh, that, you know, nowadays when I, when I think about uh, what's happening in Kashmir, I keep thinking, my goodness, in 1990, this was happening, what was I doing? You know, I, I came to, to it very late because of the disinformation and, and the, the huge, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of moral, corruption at the mm. core of this, which is so hard to get past. But basically, Kashmir is the most densely mil militarized zone in the world. You had, even at the height of the Iraq war, I think there were 65,000 US troops in Iraq. 165,000. 165, and in Kashmir, you have 700,000 Indian troops occupying this little valley. And uh, right since 1947, when India became independent and there was partition. The D Kashmir dispute started then. Mm. I'm, I'm not going to get into the history of it. You can Google it. But, <laughs> but the, the fact is that since 1990, something like 68,000 people have died in the conflict. 10,000 people have disappeared. You hear, you hear so much about Chile, about Pinochet. Uh, but you know, just in vulgar terms, in terms of mm. numbers, this is a, a much more serious, there, there are war crimes being committed there, mm. there, are, there are mass graves have been discovered, mm. there's mass torture, and yet there's a complete silence over it, you know, and when I, uh, I mean, when I went to Kashmir for the first time, I just said, look, this is a military occupation, and just, saying that was shocking to people in India and to people in Kashmir. How can an Indian be saying this? Because nobody says it, mm. you know, very few people say it. Uh, and today, uh, Kashmir is at the epicenter of, uh, you know, in 2014, when the US troops withdraw from Afghanistan, the drone attacks continue in Pakistan. Pa Pakistan is just being torn apart. And, and uh, while you have lines on the map separating Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kashmir, on the ground, those lines are not there, you know. And it is going to, and, and now that both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons, already just the day I left, the night I left for Chicago, uh, they were threatening each other mm. with war. And it's, it's a situation which the international community does need to pay. I don't know what I mean by international community, it's a horrible word, but all of us need to pay a lot of attention to because uh, it could be actually a wonderful way of uh, looking at the world anew, thinking about things outside this tired old business of, you know, nation states with standing armies and so on, because the whole world needs a buffer between these two nuclear powers, and Kashmir is, at the moment, the spark that would, could cause a war, you know? Whereas it could be a solution, and a solution in the imagination, and there are a lot of wonderful young Kashmiris who have contributed to the writings in this book, who, who are thinking about the world in very different ways. 
And, and the term intifada, which, you know, the subtitle of this book is The New Intifada in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Is there a consciousness about connections to Palestine that are being made? In Kashmir, yes. I mean, of course, there are, there are great similarities and great differences in the Israeli occupation of Palestine and the Indian occupation of Kashmir. Uh, and I don't know who can teach the other more about the art of occupation. Mm -hmm. But a friend of mine al always says that the, the major difference is that the Israelis are building the wall and, you know, trying to separate Palestine and then yet grab more and more parts of it. Whereas in India, in, in, in the case of Kashmir, India is trying to assimilate it, to digest mm. it, to, to break down its proteins and disperse it within this massive Indian nation. You know? So mm. uh, basically for India, Kash Kashmir is supposed to be the symbol of India's secularism. So you can massacre Kashmiri Muslims to prove your secularism. And Pakistan wants to claim it because it's a predominantly Muslim state. So everybody, in order to sort of prove the identities that they have given themselves, are fighting over a people who basically don't want to belong to either country. Right. You recently wrote a piece in The Guardian um, about a hanging that took place quite recently in India. I, w I wonder if you could tell people about the background to that piece and, and how that's playing out in India right now. Okay, um, in, in 2001, soon after the 9-11 attacks, as I, as I said earlier, you know, India has now realigned itself and called itself the national, natural ally of Israel and the U.S. So, uh, the, the right-wing BJP government, the, the Islamophobia that, that, um, that happened after 9-11 fed beautifully into what was going on in India. And in, 2000, uh, in 2001, December, on the 13th of December, there was this very inept, botched attack on parliament. Many of us, uh, you know, raised our eyebrows because it seemed so strange, you know, that a big white ambassador car drove in through the gates of parliament with a thing on the windscreen saying India is a very bad country and we hate India and we hate that idiot George Bush or something. And then six, five militants jumped out and killed some security guards and then they were all shot. But then there was this huge thing about India is a victim, victim of terrorism and um, these are Pakistanis and Kashmiris who've come, and within a day they had arrested four people. And they, they said that the mastermind of the parliament attack was this young uh, Kashmiri man called Gilani, who was a professor of Arabic in Delhi University. Mm -hmm. but, and then Afzal Guru, who was hanged last month, and his uh, cousin Shokat, and Shokat's wife, Afsan Guru. But uh, Gilani was clearly just picked out of thin air. And he was a professor in Delhi University. He had a lot of friends, people knew him. So a lot of people came to his defense. Mm -hmm. So when he was acquitted, people, the, the police just said, oh, actually Afzal was the main conspirator. Though, though they just tried him as a foot soldier. And it's a very, it was a long and complicated trial, but the shocking thing about it is that I actually happened to read all the papers of the court. I don't know why, I was just sitting and studying them because I was very, very disturbed by, mm. by what was going on. And in its final judgment, which was given in 2006, the Indian Supreme Court did something very strange. Firstly, it it very meticulously set out all the fabrication of evidence and how uh, you know, the police had lied and all of this was set out in the judgment. It said that this custodial confession could not be used in law. Then it said we have no direct evidence to prove that he belonged to a terrorist group. Uh, we have only circumstantial evidence. And then it said 
But in order to satisfy the collective conscience of society, we are sentencing him to death and his life must be made extinct. And then they kept him in solitary confinement for 12 years. And then just when the Supreme Court was hearing an, another case, in which Abzal's case was also mentioned about the propriety of actually hanging people who had been already for 12 years in jail, the Supreme Court had reserved its judgment, but the government just went out and hanged him well, last month. It was a terribly shocking event, which is going to have huge repercussions because deliberately, knowing that in 2014, the situation in Afghanistan will change, there are elections in Pakistan, there are elections in India, uh, why did the government decide to just kick this old football of Kashmir once again? One doesn't know, but clearly it was a thought out provocation. And uh, the, 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 what I think is going on is that the Indian economy has also begun to freeze. So the huge new middle class, the exhilaration has turned to panic. And every day, every month, there's some new issue, and the middle class is at the gates. And politicians don't know how to handle this new, aggressive, anti-political sort of rage. And they are trying to bring politics back to what it used to be, you know, communal conflagration, nationalism, a war, because many of the you know, many of the consultants, the corporates, the foundations are all involved in the business of weapons. So talking up a war, fighting a war, all these things are, are now becoming strategic political games that they need to play. You mentioned kind of anti-political currents. I'm, I'm wondering if you connect that to the movement on Ana Hazare, which in the United States at least there was a lot of attention. The New York Times regularly front page stories about Ana Hazari almost as a kind of modern avatar of Gandhi in a way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 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 Ana Hazari was, Ana Hazari was recently uh, wanting to go to war with Pakistan himself. <laughs> but um, Ana Hazari, I, I wrote a piece at the height of that movement called I'd Rather Not Be Anna, because everyone had to go around with these caps saying, I'm Anna. See, I have a very, uh, I have a very um, contrarian view, I guess, compared to everyone else on this business of anti-corruption, because I say, first of all, what do you mean by corruption? You know, when a corporation, uh, you know, gets, uh, 10,000 um, or 10 million dollars written off their taxes or when they pay a huge bribe, mm. that's corruption. When a person who's selling samosas on the street illegally pays a cop 10 bucks for being allowed to sell the samosa, that's corruption. So what do you mean by corruption? For me, corruption is a sign of an unequal distribution of power. And unless you address that, what are you saying? You want this terribly unfair system to be more efficient, or what is the movement against corruption then? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's, it's also the, the, the piece that I didn't read from today is called Capitalism, a Ghost Story, in which I talk about how, you know, corporations, the foundations that they fund, uh, which, are, which, which are these uh, new sort of I mean, in America as well as in India, they started in the 1920s, but today in India, we have the equivalent of the Rockefeller and the mm -hmm. Ford Foundation in the Reliance uh, Observer Research Foundation and the Tata Trust. But the Ford Foundation, which has spent many, many years campaigning for good governance. You see, if you look at how the World Bank works, mm -hmm. it's spending millions on anti-corruption programs in Africa, in India, in uh, East Asia, because it's a way of penetra penetrating, you know, corruption also is, is an impediment to international capital, because the local people then know how to maneuver. 
So how do you get standard business practice? You know? So it's very interesting that many of the anti-corruption crusaders are people who are funded by Ford and, fu and are winners of the Magsaysay Award. The Ma Magsaysay was the president of the Philippines who colluded with Ford and with the CIA in the coup in 1965 when General Suharto was, was uh, put in power in Indonesia uh, and something like a million communists were massacred. And now the Magsaysay Award is given for good governance to a whole lot of worthy people in India. So what is this anti-corruption thing about? I think it's, it's much more complicated than what meets the eye. Mm. So I think I would be um, very unpopular if I didn't ask you this next question. But um, I, I ask it also out of deep personal interest as well, that you have made some hints that you might be working on a novel. I wonder if that is the case and if you could tell us about that process. And well, I, I, am, I have been for a while, but now I am seriously. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's basically been, it's been, it's been, it's been uh, interesting that, you know, when I, start, when I finished writing The God of Small Things, um, it was just at the time when, this, when the entire sort of complexion of the debate had changed in India. The BJP had come to power. There was the nuclear tests. There was this sort of smell of sulfur, as Hugo Chavez <laughs> put it, in the air. And uh, so when I started writing these political essays, which have now become books, Oddly enough, each of them was just, uh, you know, wrenched out of me because I just couldn't keep quiet anymore, you know, and I, I realized that keeping quiet was as political as speaking out. But now I feel as though, you know, my own, I mean, I, I, I never write, I never wrote any of this to preach to people, you know. Almost for me, writing is a way of understanding myself and... I mean, understanding things myself. And, um, and now I feel that whatever I, I'm thinking mm. isn't straightforward anymore. You know, so it's, time to, it's time for a different kind of subversion because the immediate, urgent interventions that I did, uh, when you read them as a book, I guess you don't, the one thing you miss is the, the atmosphere and the time at which these interventions came. But now I think a lot of people are writing and, you know, intervening in these ways. And, and I feel like I need to do something differently. And I'm very, uh, actually very, uh, very curious myself to know how it'll turn out. You know? So we might mm -hmm. see you in Chicago before too long. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay, okay. And maybe would you read from The God of Small Things okay. for us? Would you? Okay, I, I mean, just to end, since I'm moving to fiction, I better go <laughs> back to it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Though you couldn't see the river from the house anymore, like a seashell always has a sea sense. The Imanum house still had a river sense, a rushing, rolling, fish swimming sense. From the dining room window where she stood, with the wind in her hair, Rahel could see the rain drum down on the rusted tin roof of what used to be their grandmother's pickle factory, paradise pickles and preserves. It lay between the house and the river. They used to make pickles, squashes, jams, curry powders, and canned pineapple, and banana jam illegally after the Food Products Organization banned it, because according to their specifications, it was neither jam nor jelly. <laughs> too thin for jelly and too thick for jam, 
an ambiguous, unclassifiable consistency, they said, as per their books. Looking back now to Rahil, it seemed as though this difficulty that their family had with classification ran much deeper than the jam jelly question. Perhaps Amu, Esther, and she were the worst transgressors. But it wasn't just them, it was the others too. They all broke the rules, they all crossed into forbidden territory, they all tampered with the laws that lay down who should be loved and how and how much. The laws that make grandmothers grandmothers, uncles uncles, mothers mothers, cousins cousins, jam jam, and jelly jelly. It was a time when uncles became fathers, mothers lovers, and cousins died and had funerals. It was a time when the unthinkable became thinkable and the impossible really happened. Even before Sophie Moll's funeral, the police found Velita. His arms had goose bumps where the handcuffs touched his skin. Cold handcuffs with a sour metal smell like steel bus rails and the smell of the bus conductor's hands from holding them. After it was all over, baby Kochama said, as he sow, so shall he reap, as though she had had nothing to do with the sowing and the reaping. She returned on her small feet to her cross-stitch embroidery. Her little toes never touched the floor. It was her idea that Esther be returned. Margaret Kochama's grief and bitterness at her daughter's death coiled inside her like an angry spring. She said nothing but slapped Esther whenever she could in the days she was there before she returned to England. Rahil watched Amu pack Esther's little trunk. Maybe they're right, Amu's whisper said. Maybe a boy does need a baba. Rahil saw that her eyes were redly dead. They consulted a twin expert in Hyderabad. She wrote back to say that it was not advisable to separate monozygotic twins but that two egg twins were no different from ordinary siblings, and that while they would certainly suffer the natural distress that children from broken homes underwent, it would be nothing more than that, nothing out of the ordinary. And so Esther was returned in a train with his tin trunk and his beige and pointy shoes rolled into his khaki hold all. First class overnight on the Madras mail to Madras, and then with a friend of their father's from Madras to Calcutta. He had a tiffin carrier with tomato sandwiches and an eagle flask with an eagle. He had terrible pictures in his head, rain, rushing inky water, and a smell sick sweet like old roses on a breeze. But worst of all, he ca carried inside him the memory of a young man with an old man's mouth the memory of a swollen face and a smashed upside down smile. Oops, we're not allowed to talk about torture, right? In this country. <laughs> so, of, of a spreading pool of clear liquid with a bare bulb reflected in it. Of a bloodshot eye that had opened, wandered, and then fixed its gaze on him. Esther. And what had Esther done? He had looked into that beloved face and said yes. Yes, it was him. The word that Esther's octopus couldn't get at. Yes, it was lodged there deep inside some fold or furrow, like a ma mango hair between molars that couldn't be worried loose. In a purely practical sense, it would probably be correct to say that it all began when Sophie Moll came to Imanum. Perhaps it's true that things can change in a day, that a few dozen hours can affect the outcome of whole lifetimes. And that when they do, those few dozen hours, like the salvaged remains of a burned house, the charred clock, the singed photograph, the scorched furniture, must be resurrected from the ruins and examined, preserved, accounted for. Little events, ordinary things, smashed and reconstituted, imbued with new meaning, suddenly they become the bleached bones of a story. Still, to say that it all began when Sophie Moll came to Imanum is only one way of looking at it. Equally, it could be argued 
that it actually began thousands of years ago, long before the Marxists came, <clears throat> before the British took Malabar, before the Dutch ascendancy, before Vasco da Gama arrived, before the Zamorin's conquest of Calicut, before three purple-robed Syrian bishops murdered by the Portuguese were found floating in the sea with coiled sea serpents riding on their chests and oysters knotted in their tangled beards. It could be argued that it began long before Christianity arrived into Kerala and seeped and see, arrived in a boat and seeped into Kerala like tea from a tea bag. That it really began in the days when the love laws were made, the laws that lay down who should be loved and how and how much. Thank you. <laughs>